take you back in time, starting in the early 1880s in Jackson history. Our compiler of this collection of images is Max Braille. Max is one of the most outstanding historical resources we have in the Jackson County Historical Society. Max was born in Greenville, Michigan in 1910 and came to Jackson when he was 11. He's, since that time, he has gotten to know this city and its people better than anyone else that I know. Our technician is Maxwell Kerr, born on a farm in Lenawee County in 1912. And I am Peter Blake, a relative newcomer who came to teach in Jackson in 1962. Now this is uh, our title to our slide, Joel, of approximately 100 slides, all done in 35 millimeter film, of early photographs, many of which I had to borrow to uh, capture the images on film. This is copied from the original 1858 atlas map of Jackson County. It was of extreme interest to me because my wife's grandfather store is in the picture, the Warren store. This is on the south side of Michigan, just east of Jackson Street, on the site of the present City Bank and Trust Company, which is now occupied by the uh, city of Jackson. This was taken from the corner of Jackson Street and Main Street, as it was then known, northwest towards the Congregational Church, showing the original church to the left, the pastor's home in the center, and the Congregational Church, which was built in 1860. Another view of the same scene that was later reproduced on a postcard. Incidentally, the police officer that was manually directing traffic at that time was a friend of mine, and we only had three of these little traffic signals that were periodically placed in the street in uh, the morning, noon, and in the evening for a period of about 15 minutes to direct, to direct the small amount of traffic that was then using Michigan Avenue. This is a view of the Congregational Church 10 years after it was built when the Chicago firm came up and jacked the entire church still in the uh, extreme addition to the height of the church. They claim it was done without any uh, mortar cracks or any joint cracks of any consequence at all. This is a view of the remaining structure of what we like to think of as the first masonry structure built in Jackson, probably built in early 36 or the middle of 1836 at the corner of Jackson Street and Main Street and uh, following the usual setback uh, we at, at that time did not build right up to the lines of the property there was quite a bit of remaining property in front of all the four buildings on the four corners. An early transport uh, vehicle in Jackson. We had two different companies that operated the horses, buggies, and they were rented for transportation to some of the immediate outlying communities and rented also for funerals and forerunner of the present taxi cabs. Right o, right o. An early view of Michigan Avenue 
from standing in front of what later we knew of as Glasgow Brothers Store looking straight west. This had to be taken a little after 1870 because of the spire on the Methodist Church, which we can see as we look in from the left side of the picture. Evidently no parking problems then. Park on either side of the street. It must not have made a bit of difference. This is the school that was built on the corner of Blackstone and Main Street, the southwest corner, an original site that was laid out for schools, and it was used as a high school until about 1907 or 19, early 1908, in which it was then used for the lower grades. And then uh, torn down to uh, make room for West Intermediate, wasn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. West Intermediate School opened in 1916. Which, of course, is now gone and replaced by the security uh, center. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just a scene of the uh, uh, dynamite blasting of the school in the tower, which was evidently quite interesting. This picture was taken by... Mr. James B. Eaton, a friend of mine, he gave it to me for my collection. Oh, I, I thought the dynamiting to uh, remove a building was a more modern technique than no. that. That's interesting that they were using it back then. I was surprised, too, to learn they were using it very early. This is our courthouse of Jackson County. It is the second courthouse, which we had, and it was demolished in 1933 or 34, and uh, to, to make way for a J.C. Penney store that mm -hmm. was built a year or so later after the courthouse was demolished. A group of firemen in front of engine house number one, which was on the south side of West Cortland, just west of Jackson Street. They were here attending the funeral of a fireman who lost his life in the fire in the Sears and Roebuck store. And they were from Lansing and Battle Creek. We had quite a group of firemen in Jackson that day. They all marched in a body to the funeral home to attend his funeral. This was a four-story structure in the downtown district, formerly an early hotel, the upper stories, and the first two stories were used for commercial purposes. It was popularly known as the White Drugstore. neighbor of mine in the uh, 1950s in Flint uh, was a pharmacist who had worked there uh, when he uh, first started his career as a pharmacist. Very interesting. This is a view of the corner of Mechanic Street and Michigan Avenue. We are standing on the southwest corner viewing north down Mechanic Street. The building on the corner over on the right side is the Jackson State Savings Bank. Many of us remember the coffee ranch house that was down behind the bank building where I was taking the picture many days and smell the roasting coffee. Mm. It was a delightful place to go into. A very early scene of our early telephone linemen at their office at that time, which was on West Cortland Street, now occupied by either the Masonic Temple or Vermillion's Furniture Store. Well, there I was thinking it was the doorway to uh, uh, what was the Knights of Columbus. Yes, that building still stands. Yeah. And uh, the three-story structure was old Mr. Bethel's 
furniture store. Hmm. He was the father of Ernie Bethel yeah. and his son Ernie that operate the lighting store on South Jackson Street in the 200 block. Two of my brother's store, which was on Michigan Avenue. This building was built in either the late 1880s or early 1890s. It still stands. Portions of the tower have been removed, but it still is kept up excellently and is used for many businesses in Jackson is their office. It was a site of the car factory over its longest period of time. It was a site during the war of the Keiko uh, radio tube manufacturing plant, which made all the radio tubes for all the Spartan radios and, of course, many others. Very interesting old building on the southeast corner of Horton and East Michigan Avenue with the city limits. They still keep those uh, uh, door uh, fittings and railing polished brass. Right. And the woodwork in those offices right. is still magnificent inside Rightly there. Rightly polished. They certainly take good care of it. One of the Lezebnik boys owns the building. Mm -hmm. We're now on the other extreme end of town on North Wisner Street. This was the site of a manufacturing plant who manufactured agricultural uh, harvesting equipment, especially in the potato industry. It was the site of the Buick Motor Car Company for three or four years. It is now occupied by the Kelsey Hayes Wheel Company. There have been several additions built to it, but basically it's the same structure. This is the Thomas A. Wilson School. This photograph was made when the school was first built. Must have been about the 1900s. I haven't researched the exact date on it. It was a beautiful school. And this is the post office which went into service 1892-1893 on the southwest corner of Washington and South Mechanic Street. It was a beautiful building, and the stone, the uh, greatest portion of the stone for its erection was mined in Jackson County. Limestone, huh? Limestone. Mm -hmm. This was our first country club in Jackson, Michigan. It was situated out on Francis Street. It was west of Francis, a bit down Meadow Heights. And it shows how primitive in the early 1900s our country club was for that period of time. And the creek in front of it here was Sharps Creek. I took this picture originally for the Farmers and Workingmen's Savings Bank, one of the few banks that came in on the Jackson scene in the 1920s. I took it mostly uh, because I was quite interested in it. They paid 1% more interest than the other banks did. <laughs> and uh, you can, uh, we're in the Dwight building on the north side of Michigan Avenue, just west of Mechanic Street, which in itself is an interesting site. I used to work at the Woolen Mills, the extreme store on the left side when I was going to school. This is the site of many streets merging at one point here on the corner of Francis and East Michigan Avenue. The Otsego is the only building you can see that's still standing there, it's isn't it? Very, uh -huh. very true. And the Dalton Hotel is a building on the right. Oh, uh -huh. uh, the four-story structure is yeah. the Sun Building. Oh, the Sun Building. The sun okay. Building, yes. It was occupied mostly by insurance offices and uh, businesses uh, that 
uh, were not transferring merchandise directly to people, insurance offices. It was an unusual structure. It was claimed by one of our leading architects in Jackson at one time. It was one of about 10 remaining structures that was built with the a center area all open right through to the roof with a huge skylight over it. There were many attempts to attempt to save it, but we just didn't find anybody that came up with the money that would attempt to restore it and save it. Yes, yes. The hotel is now a home for retired people. Well, no, that's torn down, isn't it? The one on the left is not. Oh, no, no, yeah, no. The Dalton, the Dalton is, right. is gone. Yeah. Our entire street layout has changed now uh, with our terrific changes we made on our layout in the 1950s. And here is the uh, gift of one of the groups in the city to the city of Jackson, a beautiful drinking trough for the horses, and the lower part were for dogs. It was presented by Mayor Glasgow. This clipping tells the entire story. I thought it was inter interesting enough to preserve this. The fountain still exists, but all the uh, brass plates have been taken off from it. All the lovely brass fittings are gone. It's out in the cemetery out Seymour Avenue. This is one of the two types of streetcars that were used in the city of Jackson. I presume that we went to our first electric cars around in the very late 1880s. And this is the short model that was used on the Francis Street line to Kohler Street. Uh, the line did go to Vandercook Lake, but they used a much longer car. And the same was true on the streetcars that went to Michigan Center out Page Avenue. The short ones uh, for the city limits, the longer ones for the next community that they ran into. W.R. Holton Grocery Store on South Jackson Street. W.R. was the uh, father of Mr. Holton, who used to live on West Washington Street. I used to know him well. And uh, many of these pictures will have a striking similarity. We can recognize that we're taken all by the same photographer. And he came to Jackson in 1890 and did a whole series of photographs they were later published by his Chicago firm in 12 little booklets. And I copied many of these from his photographs. This was the Union Bank of Jackson. It was a nationally chartered bank. It occupied the site of the present building, which is a 17-story structure used as the county building. It was sold to them after the bank failure. And it's just a memory now to us. I noticed that William Bug, who was still alive then, operating Bug's Jewelry, occupied the first block west of this bank at that time. These cars all do, appear to be 26 and 27, so that would date that picture. It was later the National Union Bank, and then in 1927 they received trust privileges from the Federal Reserve, and they were known as the Union National or as the Union Bank and Trust Company National Association. We can note here the four-story structure to the right of it is again the Dwight Block originally built as a four-story structure and uh, right almost at the top line of this structure you can see a, a very special coursing of bricks that runs around the, the Dwight block when they added two stories to that building ten years after it was originally built. It was quite interesting. That was a pretty structure. 
But uh, we were in an extreme state of progress then, and everything was going just great, and there was lots of expansion on the parts of business in Jackson, resulting in this one being torn down. We can associate the Bloomfield name with this bank, both father and son. The YWCA on the northeast corner of North Blackstone Street and Main Street, as it was then known, with the Blackstone Hotel in the rear. The small portion of the structure on the right side is the uh, uh, medical building that was built by Dr. Fenton and Dr. Schaefer. And then was the um, uh, school district offices, and now is the library annex, right? Right, right on. It's very and that picture is around 1940, it looks like, from the car out in front. Very useful structure to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was the Central State Bank building. Completed and first occupied in 1916. It too was on Francis Street, just uh, a very short block south of Michigan Avenue. And this was one of our six or seven banks that occupied uh, the structure. The uh, uh, six floors above the main structure of the bank were used and leased to dentists, doctors, and businesses of that type. This is a very early picture of it. A structure on Wildwood, directly east of the present Jackson High School that was built in 1926 and 27. This was a beautiful home. This was the original site of the Consumers Power Company on West Michigan, just west of our park area, and three or four other businesses were in this place before consumers bought all these frontages, used it for a year or so, and then demolished them all and built their new structure. The floor level, incidentally, on each of the structures moving to the right was at a different level. So it was very inconvenient for the employees and the consumers' power <laughs> to different floor levels, but it was merely used until they were able to start building a new one. This is old Mr. J.S. Sauer's door on South Jackson Street. This is a photograph of the tile works that was west of Cooper at the city limits. A very serious fire there destroyed the building at one time and it wasn't seen fit to uh, re-erect it. And a friend of mine, his father, Mr. Gutekunst, was the uh, supervisor or the foreman out there for the entire plant. Used to be an interesting place to visit for us when we were children. What we best remember is the Blackstone Hotel. This was really the first building in our area that was uh, used by the groups of people that bought stock in it that took care of their medical needs and their hospital needs by virtue of their being a stockholder in the organization. A very unusual experiment. One of the early ones, too, in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yes, it says White Cross Sanitarium. That's right. On it. That's and right. then I believe that was sold to the Sisters of Mercy and uh, for a very short time was Mercy Hospital before they built mm -hmm. uh, Mercy Hospital mm -hmm. On Lansing Avenue. 1914, uh -huh. 1915. It was used until Mercy right. opened up in 16. Very interesting story on that old structure. 
This is the Central State Bank many years later on the Sunday morning when the men with all the dynamite came and destroyed it. And this was the first blast. I used a 135 telephoto lens. I was way back of the railroad tracks. I wanted to be safe, of course. And this was the very first emission of mortar dust that blew out of the building. It seemed, or most of it seemed to come out of the east side. I note the building is leaning several degrees to the east. It was immediately followed by a similar blast on the other side. And then just moments later, there was just a pile of rubble about 20 feet high. I remember watching that. It was a very interesting thing to visit. And they were very late. It was supposed to have been done about 7 o'clock in the morning, and they didn't do it till about 10.30. This is one of the beautiful homes on Wildwood, east of Edward Avenue, one of the private homes. This was used by one of our famous Jackson residents. It was his home. He was a general in the Civil War, very prominent man, and those all had to be torn down in 19, early 1926 to make way for Jackson High School. This was the home on a corner of Edwards Avenue and Wildwood Avenue. This home occupied what is now the parking lot site for Jackson High School. There were three beautiful homes that were The destroyed. previous home was the home of General Withington then. General Withington, uh -huh. right. This home was very rich in, in the various woods that were used in it. And even the barn for the horses and the carriages was just beautiful. And uh, when we opened our junior college in September of 27, this was the site of our junior college until early in the 1950s. That was known as Marsh Hall, was it? Marsh Hall, named yep. after Mr. Marsh, a, mm -hmm. a prominent man in the educational circles in Jackson, Michigan. A very early picture of a very large order of Chevrolets that the Consumers Power Company purchased. At, they are using the site of their gas plant, which was on South Milwaukee Street in the six and seven hundred blocks, for the site of this lining these cars up for the picture. We uh, made all of our gas, which our present heating and cooking loads are on now, out of coal. And one of their principal byproducts was their wonderful Salve Coke that mm. Consumers Power used to deliver for heating your home. Right. It was a beautiful product. It was wonderful. And the Chevrolet dealers sales room, which at this time was at 701 East Michigan Avenue. It is now the site of a large tire company. They occupy this entire frontage here. And quite a snappy little roadster there. One that I would love to have owned in my younger days. <laughs> this is a boot and shoe store, the Fallahy store. It is so representative of our sidewalk uh, that were used in Jackson at that time. Heavy 12, 14, 16 inch planks that were used in lieu of what we now know of as concrete sidewalks. This was a typical sidewalk in the cobblestone used on the streets too. This was a very interesting picture to me. The Fallahees were really pioneers in Jackson County, and there still are Fallahees living in Jackson County. This is the site of Mr. L.H. Fields' first store. It was east of Jackson Street, later about where the Stillman store was, and east of what we now know of as the Citibank 
former Citibank structure, now City Hall. This was a very early picture. And Mr. Field is in that picture. The other members that are in the picture, I don't know whether they're family members or not. And he had two frontages there at that time. They later bought the block west of Jackson Street and later became used the entire block as the L.H. Field store. This is the site of the store that the L.H. Field store and uh, was occupied. They occupied this store right up to the point of when the store was closed. The building to the right is the courthouse and immediately behind the Leonard H. Field store they built an addition way through to Cortland much later, I believe in the late 50s or the 60s. But this was their general store. However, at this time they occupied only a small portion of the store, the Masonic Lodge. They hadn't built the Masonic Hall on Cortland Street at that time, and there were many uh, private entities occupying the store at this time, which was typical of these large blocks in those days. This is a much later picture yeah. of it, done by one of the postcard photographers that worked for the postcard printing companies. They would go through a town and... Uh, and uh, photograph the buildings that they felt would uh, be interesting to postcard purchasers. And the courthouse that was built in the early 1870s now appears on the scene. But this is an original picture of Leonard Field, the man who came here and started the old Leonard Field store. It was given to me by the family. I've never put a more elaborate frame around it. I left it just as it was given to me. I'm uh, rather proud of it. This is a very, very early picture taken at the corner, the northwest corner of Northwest Avenue and Michigan Avenue. Michigan Avenue is the street you see this side of the fence towards you viewing the picture. The house on the right has been moved, and this was the field, the original field home in Jackson. It's set back from the street much farther than any of the others. It is now the site of a very large apartment complex. But look at Michigan Avenue. It's hard to believe it is, it is Michigan Avenue. And we are now destroying... Jackson High School, which had its first class in 1908. We are looking straight north from the southeast corner. We're in St. Paul's Churchyard photographing the school. And uh, the front portion was the last portion of the school to be destroyed. It, it was a valuable resource to Jackson that was used for extension work after it closed as a high school and the new one opened in September of 27 on Wildwood Avenue. And it was a sad thing to see it go down because... Then it was City Hall for City, many years. City Hall, and, uh, many I was, years. I was in plays up on the third floor, uh, which was used by the Civic players when I first came to... Jackson in the early 1960s. How interesting. Isn't that something? Well, we hated to see it go, but it's, it was just progress, and that is all. It is now a parking lot. <laughs> this is our original police station. It was at the extreme east end of Washington Street on the south side. And it was built for a police station, and it always was used as such. And this is probably a parade day. And uh, these cars were used in the parades. And most of the people in that picture, I, I knew them all. We, I used to play in the police band, so I knew most of the fellows there. This was probably, I would guess, about 26 or 27. Mm -hmm. 
The building on the right was the interurban depot, and the freight cars were parked always on the east side in the interurban depot. I played in that police band about 1939 30. Good for you. Well, so did I. I. I played in it from the day one. This is the original water pumping station on Water Street and a one of the wells next door to the left of it. It was on the east side of Water Street and it had a large steam engine. I think one of the largest flywheels I had ever seen. It uh, was operated by steam boiler, burning coal, ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. An interesting story, many times when we had a very serious fire in Jackson, uh, they used to speed the pump up just slightly to increase the pressure a little bit in some of the mains that they were using as a result of a fire, increase the pressure and the volume of water that would be taken out of a main. I can remember the building before they tore it down and built their modern group of buildings down there for the Public Works Department. One of the old hotels in the 2000 block on East Michigan, the south side. These were very popular because at this period of time, one could apply to a factory and go to work almost immediately. Jobs were always there just for the asking. We used to have a bus company, the Brooks Bus Company, used to bring people in by the bus load and uh, they'd usually drop them off at these places where they could find a room and they could stay a week or so till they could get settled and get started on their job and then bring their family here. This was, I would say, until 1935, one of the most beautiful homes in Jackson, Michigan. It was located on the south side of West Wesley in the 300 block. And uh, John Minor lived there during the winter time. And in the summer, he would move out to his large Parma farm, John Minor farm. This was a beautiful structure, and it still stands. Still stands. It's yeah. a rather sad sight now. Yes, it, it needs stands. an awful lot of work on it, believe me. Several years ago, what we used to know of as Greenwood Park, I felt, should have a different name. We wish to name it after our Civil War governor. And uh, this is one of the, well, I would call it a reconstituted group of Civil War men that brought their group in and helped us all day long, helped make the show complete, and which we renamed Greenwood Park after our Civil War governor. Blair Park. Governor Blair. Yeah. We're at the southwest uh, corner of Mason and Greenwood Park. So I'm stepping a bit outside of Jackson now, but I always thought this was so interesting. This is a typical living room in a home of 1900. The old desk was in the living room. The kerosene lamp on the table. This was a, a typical family living room for a, a family in the, uh, uh, you might say, a middle class family. Mm -hmm. This uh, ornate coal space heater. Yes, yes. It uh, certainly fits many of them that I can remember going into mm -hmm. year after year.
take you back in time, starting in the early 1880s in Jackson history. Our compiler of this collection of images is Max Braille. Max is one of the most outstanding historical resources we have in the Jackson County Historical Society. Max was born in Greenville, Michigan in 1910 and came to Jackson when he was 11. He's, since that time, he has gotten to know this city and its people better than anyone else that I know. Our technician is Maxwell Kerr, born on a farm in Lenawee County in 1912. And I am Peter Blake, a relative newcomer who came to teach in Jackson in 1962. Uh, this is uh, our title to our slideshow of approximately 100 slides, all done in 35 millimeter film, of early photographs, many of which I had to borrow to uh, capture the images on film. A very early picture of our depot that was built in the 1870s. <clears throat> Soon after uh, eight, 1976, we did a complete restoration on it. We were allocated about $300,000 in federal funds and it was completely restored. It is done beautifully. However, we are barely using it now. It seems a shame that one of our local businesses can't come in and uh, make an everyday use of the depot now. But this is typical of 1900 days. The horse-drawn cabs waiting for one of the hourly trains that used to come in and drop their passengers. They would deliver the passengers and their baggage to their point of destination. And that was their waiting place right there. Line up and wait for the passengers to come in. Another view, only this shows the park in front of the depot and also shows one of the interurban cars that were on the uh, uh, line to either Wolf Lake or going straight through to Ann Arbor. They branched off out by Grass Lake and went to Wolf Lake and others went straight on through to Ann Arbor. But they came down this path, turned to the west on Michigan Avenue, which is a street in the immediate foreground, and went up Michigan Avenue to Francis, south on Francis, a block, and then a half a block east off from Francis into the inner urban depot. It was something that happened every hour of the day, and the depot, of course, being to the right. This was a stole house. At one time, our leading hotel in Jackson, directly south, north across from the depot on East Michigan Avenue. It, uh, it was a beautiful place in its day. Now, really, it was. And... Uh, it finally uh, was torn down. It is now the parking lot for one of the appliance businesses, which occupies the old Potter building, which we can see just a small portion of it on the right edge of the picture. This is St. Paul's original church, built soon after. 1844. I think the cornerstone does call for 1844. Very early. And uh, it is a beautiful place. A very lovely church. After very much searching, I might add many years of searching, I was fortunate enough to find a picture of one of our early coal mines in Jackson. And this is the mine as it appeared above the ground. 
this came from the Trumbull family, who were pioneers in our Jackson area. And this was near what we call Sandstone, Michigan, on West Michigan Avenue. And coal was one of our real prominent resources in the 1870s. We mined and sold a lot of it. I think it was uh, a quarter of a million tons shipped out in the mid, one year, in the mm -hmm. mid-1880s. I would like to, my mother's comment was every ton of coal she burned, we had a ton and a quarter of ashes. <laughs> <laughs> This is immediately in front of our old prison, which was on the extreme northern tip of North Mechanic Street, typical of some of the plants that were in front of it on the west side of the street, and a kind of a beautiful little fountain for its uh, period of time on the right lower corner of the picture. This is an interesting place I have attempted to research it time after time. I find uh, three different sites in Jackson that it occupied, and uh, then a sudden disappearance of it. I, I really must admit I know very little about it, but one of our very early structures. It was on South Jackson Street on two different locations, and it was on West Pearl at one location. We had a first-class merry-ground at our Hague Park, located at Vandercook Lake, approximately three miles south of Jackson Street. That looks like about, uh, oh, somewhere around World War I. By 1910, uh, post-1910, yes. By the uh, fashion. It was a beautiful setup. In fact, I have had three or four requests from collectors around the nation who collect uh, uh, merry-go-round photos to make them a photocopy of this one here. It was that important to, uh, uh, as we look back on a period of time. This is a lovely place to go for people without a automobile because a streetcar would take you out there. And we had those summer streetcars with the open sides. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience to go out there and spend a day, a balloon ascension during the warm summer days every Sunday. It was a really a good place to spend a, a Sunday. Bathing beach, everything. This gray building of three stories, the highest one in this scene, is the site of our first opera house in Jackson, Michigan. It was uh, used for years as an opera house, and it's had so many uses since then. However, I note an article in the paper just the last year said that you can still go up on the second floor and still see markings on the wall, on the plaster of uh, sections of where the layout was for the old opera house. We That's had on Pearl Street. On West Pearl, Pearl, south side of West Pearl, between Mechanic Street and Jackson Street. Now and the side of Schubert. Of course, most or many of those opera houses never saw an opera. It was uh, uh, at a time when the theater in general was in disrepute. The... Um, uh, they named them opera houses to give them a little bit loftier tone. <laughs> mm -hmm. However, uh, as we go over to the Majestic, uh, it changed because we had some of the leading, later some of the leading players in Hollywood had oh, yeah. played at the old, yes. formerly what we know of as the Majestic Theater. Another one of the lovely homes that was on West Trail Street. This home was on the site of the extreme west end of the former parking lot for Mercy Hospital. And this was really one of the fine homes of Jackson. Again, many various types of wood used in finishing it. And uh, 
it it was one of the finest really it was really one of the first homes that had one of our early types of air conditioning in it you can see a portion of the tower raising above the ridge of the roof behind the roof on the right side it was a natural there was a dance hall on the third floor and it was a place for an entertainment for many of Jack's Philians in the 1880s, 1890s. One of our parochial schools on Cooper Street, St. John's, right next door to the St. John's Church in the parish home. And a wonderful school. Again, a stone on the first level was from a Jackson County mine, and that operated well into the 1920s, or maybe even into the early 30s, and it was finally outgrown, and they built a school uh, on the east side of the street, north of West Ganson Street, is now the site of their new school. A beautiful school there, too. This it was our home for the indigents of the day, or the poor house, as it was called. Out on County Farm Road. Yes, it was. was. Named County Farm Road because that led to the County Farm. That's right, it did. It was the only place to go if you were old, unemployed, or sick, and no income whatsoever. Our plan of government in those days didn't provide enough to take care of these people. I remember one Jackson County merchant that for years occupied a store on Francis Street that was confined there until he died and he'd lost everything. It, it was uh, sickening to think about it but as it's compared to our present system but that was the way it was. Known popularly as the poorhouse. That was known as the poorhouse. But I'm sure it wasn't called a poorhouse by the residents. No. <laughs> I'm sure. Right. One of our early musical groups, young men in one of the photo studios in Jackson, were about 1910 here. And uh, the instructor and the teacher is Bill Bailey. Mm -hmm. The man in the second row with the mustache. This is Won't his, you come home, Bill Bailey? Right, oh. This is his group of young boys and young men. I can't identif identify more than two of them, but many of them were later to become some of Jackson's leading businessmen. Music was a hobby that was really pursued by people in these days, really. It was one of the few that you could pursue at home. This is a very early picture of our police department at the building that was formerly used as we would call it a police station. We had a different form of government at that time. We had a civilian police commissioner. He represented all the wards. It's interesting, each policeman has a mustache and they're in full dress uniform. This is the William Thompson home. It was on the 300 block of North Blackstone Street on the west side, corner of Van Buren. Surely one of our most elaborate homes that we'd ever had built in our area. It was used for its last 25 or 30 years as a St. Joseph's Orphanage, and it came down to build an apartment house. How sad. The uh, uh, designation on that postcard says the nunnery. It's Jackson extremely Michigan. wrong. It was one of the errors that were occasionally made by the uh, uh -huh. postcard well, of course, companies. The nunnery is a convent, and uh, yes, and so it. I suppose the. It was being used by that time as uh, an very, orphanage run very, by the uh, very possible. Uh, sisters. I always attributed it to a uh, little carelessness and uh, mm -hmm.
titling their printing plate. And of course, we all can recognize the old fire department, the old steam pumper. We're coming east on East Michigan. We're at the head of Francis Street. And other than the fire department and the Harley Davidson motorcycle, all I can recognize is the Bonton Theater, one of our 10 cent movie houses, and our brick pavement on Michigan Avenue of the day. And of course, when they got to the fire, they had a full head of steam, believe me. We can best remember this as the Regent Theater. It was an early opera house built, I believe, in the 1870s. It was known as the Heard Opera House. The same family controlled the uh, the uh, large uh, hotel, which we later knew as the Odd Seagull. And this uh, certainly had some of the finest acts. We were on the of course, on the Chicago to Detroit railroad line, and we enjoyed some of the very finest uh, acts that were available to any opera house in the nation, really. Played right here at the Herd. This burned in 1899 and uh, left the walls all intact. So, in 1902, it evolved into this place using most of the same walls. It was unused for several years and it still ran opera and uh, it's an entirely a little bit different mode right here. Some of the earliest movies that used to be available to people as primitive as they were showed here. I think the first talking movie that we saw here in this area was shown here. It uh -huh. was known as the Bijou at that yeah. time, yes. And it, it later developed principally in movies, newsreels, and, and film. And uh, this was its final state, the Regent Theater. It was quite a popular place. They always had a good movies, newsreels, and usually five acts of vaudeville, except during uh, six weeks during the summer, the hottest months, uh, July and part of August, they had just the movies, you know. And it was on the southeast corner of Francis and Cortland Street. With a new layout of all the streets and everything, it's very difficult to tell you just where it was. The police station and the inner urban station was right next door to it, and the police station was behind it. This is one of the Jackson cars that ran over the line on the inter urban. To Battle Creek. Jackson, Battle Creek, and something else. Mm -hmm. It was uh, probably one of the cheapest forms of travel that you could use a little slower because of the more frequent stops they made, but if you weren't in a hurry, why, it, it was a nice ride. They all went out in the state uh, within a few years of each other, uh, around uh, 1929 29. to 1933. Yeah, that's when there. they went out, yeah. 33 was the last of them, yeah. This was on the Ann Arbor run, about at the switching point where they go to Wolf Lake. Believe it or not, this is what we know of today as the Odd Seagull Rooming House that was the former Odd Seagull Hotel. This was the way it looked in 1875. And uh, with two stores added on on the west side of it, it's been there a long while. At one time it was owned and operated by the Pantland brothers in Grand Rapids, who ran oh, the large yeah. Pantland hotel sure. chain. We're now in the First Methodist Church, built in 1870 on West Michigan Avenue, showing their 
very elaborate organ that they had and a very elaborate interior. Which they still it's have. It's basically the yeah. same thing today with some remodeling. Mm -hmm. They have done very well in keeping it in its close to its original form. It's well worth a visit if you've never been in there. They're having a contest here of uh, various choirs from various parts of the state, and they're having a day of singing. This is one of our typical traveling merchants around Jackson, Iron Branch. They were on Pearl Street, immediately west of North Mechanic Street, the first frontage behind what we now know of as the Michigan Theater. That was in the days when bakeries as well as dairies uh, delivered uh, two houses mm -hmm. with similar uh, uh, vehicles. Right. They usually ran a little tinkle the bell and mm -hmm. people came out, bought from the man who was uh, handling the rig. That was a good way to sell in those days. We're now on the stage of the Majestic Theater, and uh, we're in that period of time, four to five years, when the Wright players mm -hmm. occupied the Majestic Theater. No movies, no vaudeville, merely stock acts. And most of the Wright players are in this scene, including the four course girls on the right, and I always save this picture because one of my schoolmates, Howard Adams, that graduated with me, uh, uh, played with the Wright players for a few years before he went to Hollywood. And he's in this scene here, too. Victor Jory was one of the most famous of the Wright players mm -hmm. that went on to a career in Hollywood. he uh, be in that picture right there. Uh-huh. Uh yeah. And uh, the... Um, a uh, woman who had been with the Wright players, uh, they also operated in Flint, uh, was the first director of the Flint Community Players when uh, professional theater went out in Flint and the amateurs started mm -hmm. up to fill the void. Yeah. Well, I'm rather proud of this picture because I went through school with Howard. Uh-huh. He later was killed in an accident uh, in an airplane photographing a man on a rear passenger car of a train when the airplane crashed into the train and mm. killed him. He was working on that in the Hollywood movies. This is a familiar view to those of us who can remember the corner of Milwaukee and East Michigan Avenue with a traffic control tower. It at one time was operated by the railroad, later operated by the police department. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a familiar scene to all of us who uh, were here at that time. I don't know whether you would better use this. Oh, or yes. Not. That's part of Jackson's history, Max. Well, it is. It's part of the whole history of the Midwest. It sure is. This was a tri state convention of the Ku Klux Klan, or as I say, the Night Sheet Boys. And uh, they had a very large three-day convention here. And they were out Seymour Avenue. That area now is the cemetery, a fitting place for them to meet. And they, this was probably one of the longest parades we ever had in Jackson, Michigan. As far as you can see down in the picture. That would be early 1920s. In about 23, perhaps as late as 24, we are uh, in front of the Sun Building, Otsego Alley right here. All traffic stopped, streetcars and everything. They marched up to Blackstone Street and turned north and went to the fairgrounds and had a large meeting there all that day. I don't know what type of meeting it was, but... There's enough sheets here to use in all the hotels in the state of Michigan. 
And uh, a little later, we had repercussions on the Ku Klux Klan here in Jackson. Four or five of the members from Napoleon spent a long time in our prison out there. But that's all I know about them. I know nothing else about them at all. But I have two pictures. This is a beautiful block on East Michigan, the north side directly across from the depot. It was known as the Brooks Block. It was typical of how the old timers used to build, a, put in a building. It was beautiful. We stepped out of Jackson, I'm sorry, over to Parma. One of our interurbans have jumped the track and knocked down the building, which is now their library. My uncle ran the hardware store in uh, Parma, so naturally, of course, I had to go out and see what happened. I don't believe anyone was hurt in this accident, but it jumped the track and went right through the library. Service suspended for a short period of time. <laughs> this is our number one fire department on West Cortland Street, about, oh, it's a post-1900 photograph. Uh, their uh, vehicle, uh, would uh, motor vehicle would record that, was still using the steam pumper and still using the horses. And I note that the buildings to the west of this building that I knew of are not there, so it precedes that slightly. There was no house up there. It's quite an interesting picture. Transition yeah. period in fighting it's, fire. It's a transition period is right. A, a demonstration the railroad used to give now and then showing uh, an accident, you know, and how a, and uh, I think they used to use it at the fairgrounds now and then. I don't know too much about it, uh, to be truthful with you. It, take uh, engines that were going to be scrapped and run them together. Huh? right oh, right oh. This is one of the typical ones. They're going to scrap heap anyway, and then yep. might as well help the junk dealer break them up into smaller pieces. I never got a good picture of the Griswold School until a few days after they started demolishing it, and this is the only picture I have of the Griswold School, which was built in 18. 77. It's the only picture I have of it. If anyone can help me and loan me one, call me and I'll photograph it and appreciate it ever so much. This is early day of our first bus systems. We're standing on the northwest corner of Mechanic and Francis Street. Our camera is looking down towards Jury Row store on South Mechanic and Smith and Winchesters. And also our first Fitzgerald bus with the lane shop directly across uh -huh. the street. And uh, those were Model A Forge, rather small buses, five cent fare to anywhere except Michigan Center and Van Cook Lake. That was seven and a half cents. It was certainly helped Jackson. Jackson came a long ways. We can see the web block across to the right, just this side of uh, Smith and Winchester's, which was the site of the old Rumler Saloon. A very interesting picture. It brings back a lot of memories to me. I wrote the War Department at one time, and I've got this picture from them showing the Jackson War Camp here. This is a Jackson photo. In 1864, it was used as a recovery camp before they discharged many of the veterans that had been Now that was Camp injured. Blair, was it? Camp Blair, yes. And that was located over in the area where Kelsey Hayes now Yes, is? it was, uh -huh. North Wizard Street area. And uh, this is as it appeared at that time. I got two pictures. I only photographed one of them. I just wanted it to show. The other one might have been taken a slightly different period of time. 
it shows the flag at half mast. I've often wondered if that was after Lincoln was shot, but I don't know. This is the lovely old farm on Probert Road when it was in all its beauty before it was made into factories and everything else during the wars. It was a beautiful thing. This picture was taken before 1890. It must have been lovely. You can't even see that from the from Probert Road anymore. No, no. They're just building a huge house mm. in front of it. Right. Mr. Carter built his home there, Collins Carter. And uh, this was beautiful. The cost must have been something even in those days. We're looking at the corner of Francis and Michigan Avenue, or as it was called then, Main Street. Mm -hmm. This is before the big fire that burned the hotels down that burned east to the river, and all that was rebuilt again. Later, the Dalton Hotel stood right here where this one was. And this was a central city clothiers. And uh, this is a reminder of our beautiful old Homemade Food Company mm -hmm. on West Michigan Avenue. I remember taking that picture. The professional photographer was there. He arranged the picture, so I just sneaked up beside him with my 35 millimeter <laughs> camera and made it slide. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, I used to eat lunch there every day. 35 cents would buy you a Good beautiful food. lunch at the counter on the main floor. And here is the uh, streetcar going under the North Jackson Street viaduct, which used to fill with water when there was a very heavy rain. <clears throat> and, of course, these are all different today. Crankshaft is in there <clears throat> with their factory. Walk up lathe, build a plant farther south. This is the beautiful, sharp home on West Michigan Avenue at 407 West Michigan. In the day before somebody built a retail Radio store TV, place right. in front of it and ruined the beauty of it, it was a beautiful place. That is probably Ella Sharp and her husband getting in their carriage to go somewhere. And here is a lovely home, as it appeared before any great amount of restoration had been attempted on it. Uh, just as soon as we have a little snow, I'm going over there and photograph it again. It's one of three homes that was built on East High Street. This is the one on the south side, the only remaining one of the three before anything was done to it. it looks quite nice now. It does it? fine. Yes. I know the young man. He worked for Commonwealth Engineering uh, that had put so much money in it. He told me once what it cost him just to do the porch. And I thought I was spending a lot of money redoing my schoolhouse, but uh, I changed my mind. But when he gets through with this, it's going to be a thing of beauty. The tower is lovely today. It's worth driving by real slowly and looking it over. Yeah. A very early picture of the Majestic Theater. And that building still says Public Library about halfway up the mm -hmm. facade. The site because that was, on that the, was the site of our floor. library through yep. 1907 before Carnegie's, the Carnegie Library was opened. Mm -hmm. A plumbing company was on the corner, and uh, that was uh, the old Bloomfield Block, as it was called. Be made a beautiful red sandstone. It was a beautiful building. This is the St. Mary's block as it appeared previous to 1931-32. And according to old sources who belonged to church I used to talk to, they had not acquired this house on the corner yet. Mm. They later acquired it. It was a rooming house, and uh, you could come in there and room for a while until you could locate your permanent place you wanted to live. 
This was an early place on Cooper Street. Uh, it was uh, one of the Irish Lodge Halls. It later burned down. I believe it was when it burned down. It wasn't at the Odd Fellows Hall that the mm. fire occurred at. It's been quite a bit of time since I have showed these, so I, my memory isn't right up the moment unless I look at some notes. But this was a site of uh, a prominent uh, family in Jackson, lived in it for years. <laughs> Less said about this one, the better. <laughs> the sheriff's annual destruction day of all the liquor he had seized. This was Warren Stoddard's administration. We're in front of the county sealer of weights and measures. It is now the site of the rear end of the field store. And a lot of friends of mine are in here. Here's uh, Mr. Butts. He was one of the deputy sheriffs. He used to ride the Henderson motorcycle throughout the county and do patrolling for speeding, and etc. And uh, all the good stuff has long since disappeared. It wasn't put down the drain, you can be sure of that. All right. And uh, many other people in there we all know. The crowd is gathered to smell the fumes. They uh, watch, they <laughs> love to watch them break the bottles. Right. <laughs> oh, this is a grand day. It occurred just once a year. And believe me, it drew a crowd. Yeah. It was odor mm -hmm. and viewing. Mm -hmm. This was a car that the Sparks Weddington Company made up for the state police, a uh, proposed state police car. And uh, it was a beautiful job. It, it was bulletproof. Uh, this was to chase the bootleggers when they were firing at them on Bulletproof windshield, bulletproof radiator entirely, and and uh, bulletproof front tires. More of a demonstration model. And I like to think of this as our Mr. Loomis, who was a very prominent citizen. His gift of the lovely park on East Ganson and East Michigan. Uh, uh, connecting the two streets, a lovely Loomis Park as we know it today, his gift to the city of Jackson. But it was a beautiful day and a lovely cumulus cloud, and the more we know about Mr. Loomis, the more we know about the history of Jackson. And of course, Cap Sparks. It's a shame the vandalism that his grave stone has suffered over there on South Jackson Street. You just can't believe that people would do the damage to the beautiful figure, bronze figure that stands there in front of it. I can't believe it. And of course our final one appearing in our cemetery on Greenwood. This was originally would have been a much more ornate figure, but her will was contested and the relatives did receive quite a chunk of her will, a good fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars of it. And what was left, they spent for this figure mm -hmm. to remember our soldiers in our cemetery on South Jackson and Morrell Street. And I talked with her many years before she died, and she told me the whole story. It was quite sad. Relatives stepped in after the bequest was made and contested the will. Mount Evergreen. Mm -hmm. on it is, it is beautiful. Uh -huh. It is beautiful. Right, right on facing Morrell Street. This, of course, is a beautiful shot. That's this it. is one of the two Laredo You're cast. Right. The other one Jackson's is the War Memorial at Withington Park. We're so proud right. to uh, enjoy two Laredo tasks in Jackson. Right. Why, it's almost unheard of for a community as small as we are. But this was done for the... Uh, family that used to live up at 762 West Michigan. He was one of the founders of the Consumers Power Company. This is on the foot grave, and that is out Woodlands, on Francis it. Street. Yeah. Yes, William Foot. The original cost of that was around $10,000. Mm -hmm. I had a, a man from Chicago here one day, and I was showing it to him. I had just attempted to clean off some 
paint. It still shows on the picture that someone poured over the head and it ran down all over the body. And uh, he said that would be very conservatively valued at a quarter of a million dollars today. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your time that you've spent with me. Speaking only as an amateur, but a very serious one. Thank you and very much, uh, I, Max, for I'm sharing sure. your trip into the past with us. I'm into a time when Jackson was one of the larger cities of the state. When you started out mm -hmm. in the 1880s, mm -hmm. it uh, with some of those pictures in the 1870s, this was the third largest city in Michigan, right after Detroit mm -hmm. and Grand Rapids. Uh, by 1900, it was still the fifth largest. Uh, uh, Bay City and Saginaw had crept in above us, and uh, in the eight in the 1980 census. I believe it was 33rd, and uh, this fall when they finally published the results of the 1990 census, I will be interested in seeing what our position is now. But this has been a wonderful look into the past of Jackson. No one else could put it together the way you have, and thank you very much, Max. Well, it's a pleasure to do it for you. The date today is... October, October the 4th, 4th 1990. 1990.